My name is Rory Raven. Uh, I'm a kind of a local historian. Uh, I could call myself an amateur historian. And I say that really to sort of separate myself uh, a little bit from uh, the, the real historians who have PhDs and have done real work. Uh, I'm just a guy who reads a lot um, and gets fascinated with different topics, one of which is spiritualism and seances in the 19th century. Now, uh, seances and spiritualism uh, is a fascinating part of American history. We've sort of overlooked it, I think, um, and it really deserves a, a closer look because it's, it's a fascinating chapter and there's all kinds of amazing stuff uh, going on. Now, the belief in uh, uh, ghosts and spirits and life after life uh, seems to be one of the oldest human beliefs. Uh, people seem to have believed this from the earliest days. Looking back to the, the beginnings of, of history, we find Neanderthals uh, used to bury their dead with food and tools. Uh, and most archaeologists would say that you wouldn't include stuff in a, a burial like that unless you thought that the person you were burying was going somewhere that they would need that stuff uh, where they were going. Uh, you see this kind of brought to a real high point uh, with the ancient Egyptians. All the stuff they packed into those pharaohs' tombs because they thought the pharaohs were going on to another world, uh, another life, and they needed all their worldly goods uh, with them. This idea that when we die, we go someplace uh, seems to be really, really deep uh, in the human psyche. And in the 19th century, in upstate New York, this idea came back with a vengeance. Now, um, our story begins in March of 1848 in a little village called Hydesville, which is way in upstate New York, uh, near Rochester. And it's in a, a part of upstate New York, which is called the Burned Over District. And there have been a lot of uh, religious revivals um, burning through the area, giving it the name, the Burned Over District. Uh, this is the part of the, the map where Joseph Smith finds the golden tablets and begins uh, Mormonism. We always think of them as being out in Salt Lake City, but they begin in upstate New York uh, in this Burned Over District. Now, back then, from what I've read, uh, upstate New York seems to be kind of what we think of as Southern California today. It's, it, back then, it was the, the crazy, weird, hippie, kooky place uh, where you would expect weird things like this to happen. And in upstate New York, uh, in Hydesville, lives this family named Fox. Uh, it's a Mr. and Mrs. Fox, uh, mother and father. Um, uh, there's a brother, and there are two little girls, uh, Margaret and Kate. Uh, Margareta, or Maggie, as she's usually called, um, and uh, Catherine Kate. And they're probably 12, 13, 14, thereabouts. Uh, their ages are a little bit hard to, to pin down, but, but they're young uh, adolescent or pre-adolescent girls. And they live up there in Hydesville in a very simple little cottage uh, with the family. And in March of 1848... Uh, the family is kept awake night after night by these weird sort of rapping sounds that sound throughout the cottage. They have no idea where these things are coming from. Uh, but they seem to center on the two little girls. When the little girls aren't around, these raps aren't, aren't being heard. When the girls are around, the raps seem to center on them. Um, at one point, uh, the, the girls actually start asking questions uh, of the empty air. Um, one of them... Uh, again, accounts differ as to which one of them uh, first speaks, uh, but they start asking uh, the empty air, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? And they'll, they'll get, you know, three raps if they're holding up three, uh, three fingers. One of the girls um, says, here, Mr. Splitfoot, do as I do. And she snaps her fingers twice and she gets these two raps in response. She then makes the motion, she mimes snapping her fingers twice, two or three times, uh, without making sound, just sort of faking the, the motion. When she does that, she gets the appropriate number of raps back. She turns to her mother and she says, Mother, it can see as well as hear. Her mom is completely freaked out by this. There is some sort of unseen entity hanging around in the Fox family cottage, uh, wrapping out answers um, to these questions that people are, are posing. And the answers are correct. Word starts to spread. There's not a lot to do uh, in Hydesville uh, in March of 1848, so word spreads pretty quickly. Uh, people start coming from miles around, uh, paying 25 cents uh, to have a seance with the spirit or spirits that seems to be hanging around the uh, Fox family cottage. 
uh, people ask questions the spirits wrap out uh, answers. They'll uh, wrap once for yes or twice for no. Uh, they will wrap out uh, people's ages, the number of children people have. Somebody realizes that if you recite the alphabet, the spirits will then wrap the appropriate um, letter. So now whole messages can be spelled out. So over the next few weeks, um, the, uh, the spirit uh, haunting the, the Fox family cottage explains through the mediums uh through through rapping uh that it is the uh it is a, a fellow named charles rosma who was a peddler uh who said he came through um hydesville a couple of years before the fox family moved into that cottage and that the previous tenant of the cottage had killed the guy the peddler and buried him in the cellar um now as if it wasn't weird enough already to have some unseen uh entity now we find out that the 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 weird uh creature the weird entity that is wrapping out these uh these answers to questions is a dead guy buried in the cellar um there are some excavations or attempts at excavating uh the cellar to find out if there's any bones down there but but accounts disagree uh, as to what if anything anybody finds they do however peg the previous tenant of the cottage a fellow named bell um and people start looking at bell for a murderer and uh, Bell is, is understandably creeped out uh, about this, but a number of people uh, vouch for Bell and say, no, the, the spirit or whatever this is must be wrong. Um, and there, there are people uh, actually sign a petition attesting to Bell's good character. Uh, but, but Bell has a, a rough time uh, for, for a while after this, this happened. People kind of looking at him, uh, thinking he's, he's good for this murdered peddler uh, down in the cellar. So word continues to spread. Now, the, uh, the Fox family has another daughter named Leah who lives in Rochester. This is a little bit of a distance uh, away. And she hears about what's going on. People were saying, hey, Leah, aren't you from Hydesville? There, there's some talk about uh, a Fox family uh, hearing these weird raps. And your, your maiden name is Fox, right? Uh, so Leah heads home uh, and, and goes to, to see what is going on. She takes her sisters aside and says, what the hell's going on? Um, and they discuss these weird spirit raps uh, that centers on these two little girls. In tellings and retellings of the story, Leah is usually made out to be the villain of the piece. She's the one who has this brilliant idea that, you know, there might be some money in this. Uh, we might be able to, to get some fame and fortune out of this. Leah takes her two uh, sisters. He know, she knows that you're not really going to get very far hanging around in Hydesville brings her sisters uh, back to Rochester uh, to put on a public demonstration. They rent the Corinthian Hall. The Corinthian Hall had just been built uh, in Rochester. It's a big auditorium. It's still standing today. Uh, and they mention this event on their website, which I think is amazing. Um, they rent the Corinthian Hall to give the first sort of public demonstration uh, of this spirit power. Now, that doesn't sound very important, but it actually is more important than you, you think. Um, the Corinthian Hall, it's, it's a big public uh, hall. It's not connected to any one group. So by giving this first public demonstration uh, of spirit power to a packed audience in a secular hall, a uh, public hall, this means that the spirits aren't tied to any one group. Uh, the spirits aren't, you know, a Catholic thing or an Episcopalian thing or a Masonic thing. The spirits are for everyone. So whatever your background is, you can still be interested in this idea of the spirits making contact with us through these weird raps, which of course begin to be called the Rochester raps. These two little girls uh, stand on the stage and they, they summon up spirit power. And in front of a packed hall, these weird raps uh, sound everywhere. Uh, people come in utterly uh, mystified, and they leave just as mystified. Some people come in uh, swearing, this is a trick, this is a hoax, I'm going to find out what it is. One guy comes in, says he will throw himself off Niagara Falls if he can't figure out what's going on. Uh, he doesn't figure out what's going on. He doesn't throw himself off of uh, Niagara Falls. Um, somebody else... Um, has a theory uh, about what's going on. He says that there's some kind of device that the girls have uh, hidden in their clothing that is producing these these weird uh, raps. Uh, the, the phrase he uses is that he thinks that there is something hanging from the girls' inexpressibles under their gowns uh, that's helping them produce these, these weird raps. 
the rap sound throughout the hall. They answer questions just like they did back in Hydesville. If you recite the alphabet, uh, the spirits will rap at the appropriate letter uh, with the alphabet uh, when you're spelling out the alphabet. And they spell out these messages from the beyond. People are mystified. People are puzzled. People have no idea what's going on. They argue about this and tickets sell. And spiritualism uh, has arrived uh, in early 19th century America. Now, one of the reasons that I kind of focus on the American chapters of this story is that I really think uh, this is a very American kind of uh, kind of movement. Uh, it comes from the area in uh, upstate New York where some of these uh, religious movements uh, get started, like Mormonism. Um, and it also really keys into a couple of uh, real 19th century American ideas. Um, now, uh, this is 1848. And uh, in 1841, P.T. Barnum has opened his museum uh, where you can go see curiosities. Uh, you can go see the Fiji mermaid and all these other kind of weird things that may or may not be real, but, but you, don't, you don't really know what to make of them, but they're fascinating anyway. And people argue, is this real, is this not? So a lot of that kind of thinking is in the air. Um, this sort of uh, thirst for curiosities and, and, and what's out there, what's possible. Is the world bigger than we thought? Um, also, uh, it, it keys into the idea that you can make up your own mind. You can go to one of these uh, public demonstrations and you can hear these raps and you can believe the evidence of your own eyes. All very empirical, very rational, very scientific. All very American in the 19th century. Um, so it keys in, I think, to the sort of uh, the American zeitgeist uh, there at the time. Um, the, uh, the, the word kind of spreads uh, and spreads pretty soon. Horace Greeley, go west, young man, right? Horace Greeley hears about this. Uh, he pays the girl's way down to New York City. Now, these two little girls from Hydesville, uh, upstate New York, are down in New York City, center of the universe. Um, and they uh, are put up in a nice hotel. Uh, and pretty soon, the cream of New York society is going to seances at the hotel uh, with these two little girls from upstate. And this is when it really takes off uh, and it becomes kind of a, a who's who of American history uh, and American literature. I was a, a lit major back in college, uh, so I, I see a lot of familiar uh, names. Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she goes to seances at the hotel uh, there in New York with, with the girls. Um, James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote The Last of the Mohicans, he goes to seances um, at the hotel. Julia Ward Howe, Battle Hymn of the Republic, she goes to seances at the hotel. Commodore Cornelius of Vanderbilt, the millionaire, he goes to seances, he tries to get stock tips from the beyond. Uh, so this becomes a craze. People go to seances, they are amazed by what they see, and what they hear, and what they experience. Uh, it spreads, the, the craze spreads, it continues. Um, within just a few years, uh, 1852, um, Spirit, uh, spirit medium uh, named Mrs. Hayden, a woman from Boston, goes over to England and starts holding seances in England. Uh, whenever I've talked to people about seances, they often think, oh, it must be an English thing that came over to America. But no, it's an American thing that went to England. Uh, she is brought over uh, to hold seances. She sets up a, uh, a, a seance parlor in Half Moon Street in London. Uh, and, and pretty soon, the English are just as fascinated by seances um, as the Americans were. Uh, there is a rumor that Queen Victoria went to seances there. Um, and also, uh, Charles Dickens uh, went to seances there. Charles Dickens, however, was not having any of it. Charles Dickens at one point said, I have not the least belief in the awful unseen being available for evening parties at so much per night. Uh, so Dickens wasn't having it at all. Also in England, another early skeptic uh, was a fellow named John Neville Maskelyne. John Neville Maskelyne is a very famous English magician. Um, American magicians look to Houdini for inspiration. English magicians generally look to Maskelyne uh, for inspiration. He's the big name in magic over there. Uh, Maskelyne was not having any of it. Um, he said, uh, oh, oh, Yankee Doodle, inventor of wooden nutmegs and new religions. How easily are you Barnumized? Uh, again, bringing up uh, Barnum and his, uh, his humbug. But nonetheless, uh, this craze continues in the UK uh, and back here uh, in the US. Now, not everyone uh, is quite as, as thrilled. There, there is some pushback. There are skeptics uh, who come forward. 
and you would expect the the skeptics uh, who come forward and, and criticize spiritualism, you expect them to be maybe scientists, men of science and learning, but actually, uh, most of the early skeptics uh, are, are the more uh, traditionally religious folks who, who feel that this is all a little creepy, a little weird, a little devil worshipy, maybe, um, and that this this can't be. Uh, the, the right kind of good religion. There's, there's something something eerie and weird uh, going on here. Um, so there are, this is being the 19th century, uh, there are, of course, uh, pamphlets uh, published. It's the golden age of the pamphlet. So you, you see a lot of pushback from uh, religious folks who put out these pamphlets, which have great titles. Uh, things like, uh, titles like Infidelity of the Times as Connected with the Wrappings and Mesmerists. Another one called Ancient Sorcery as Revived in Modern Spiritualism, Examined by Divine Law and Testimony. And my favorite uh, is one that is entitled The Spirit Wrappings, Mesmerism, Clairvoyance, Visions, Revelations, Startling Phenomena, and the Infidelity of the Wrapping Fraternity Calmly Considered and Exposed. But nonetheless, people uh, come to seances um, and leave amazed. And they talk about it. And they wonder what the hell's going on. Uh, and, and ticket sell and controversy uh, continues. And people start doing this in their own home. Uh, seances are somewhat different than, I think, TV and movies uh, have led us to believe. Uh, in many uh, seance movies, you, you sit down at a round table. You join hands. Uh, you take deep breaths. The... the the lights go down and maybe something moves on the table and the table moves around a little bit and perhaps a, a, a spirit voice uh, is heard. That sort of stuff does happen, but there are other things that used to happen at seances that we've kind of forgotten about today uh, because I think they don't fit with our modern ideas uh, of, um, uh, of what seances are about, which are a little bit skewed. Uh, we forget that even though it was um, not a, a religious movement, it did have some religious overtones. Um, so there's a lot of hymn singing uh, at seances. Sometimes the hymn singing can go on for hours uh, while you're waiting for the spirits to show up. One of the other sort of weird features um, that we uh, you see in, in seances is the cabinet. Um, now. The cabinet can sometimes be an actual physical box. Um, other times it can just be a curtain drawn across a corner of the room. The purpose of the, of the, the cabinet is so that the medium can withdraw to the cabinet, uh, draw the curtains or close the door, so they'll have perfect darkness. Uh, and they, they need perfect darkness to, to really manifest the spirit power. Now, to us, this seems really pretty fishy. Uh, but back then, uh, this was a, a key part of the seance. Uh, there are cases of mediums retiring to, to a cabinet, closing the doors, hymns are sung, uh, and after half an hour or so, a spirit emerges from the cabinet, walks out of the cabinet, walks around the sounds table, talks to people, converses with them, and a lot of times that spirit looks a whole lot like the medium. And you're not supposed to look in the cabinet, because if you open the door of the cabinet, light gets in there, it's going to hurt the medium uh, who's there in the cabinet. I bet. Um, sort of thing that seems kind of uh, fishy to us, but but not to them, apparently. Uh, it's a regular feature uh, at seances. So the craze continues. Um, and because it's the 19th century, and because, as I said, it's this kind of, you know, reformist progressive uh, age, uh, this becomes really appealing to a broad range of uh, of, of liberals, uh, of, forth, of progressives, uh, reformers, so that people who get into uh, to seances, and, and this kind of freaks out some of the, the old guard, are uh, people who support things like uh, free love and socialism uh, and votes for women. Victoria Woodhull, first woman to run for uh, president uh, of the United States. She actually uh, is mediumistic. She publishes a newspaper for a while that has some spiritualist content. You think the media is messed up today. In 1850, 1860, 1870, you had newspapers publishing dispatches from the Summerland, which is the um, spiritualist idea of, uh, of the afterlife. It's not quite heaven, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's paradise. People start asking questions about, you know, what's the Summerland like? Uh, what is, what is uh, the afterlife like? And uh, it's 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 beautiful. It's perfect. You can go to the the happy summer land, and you can converse with Plato and Shakespeare and Ben Franklin. Um, everything is perfect and wonderful. Um, it's unsurprising that um, 
because so many liberals and progressives kind of latch on to this this philosophical movement of spiritualism, uh, a lot of abolitionists get uh, involved in it. And one person does ask, and this is a little weird to me, um, not the question, but the answer. Uh, somebody asks, are there Negroes in heaven? Uh, and the, the spirits uh, wrap back the answer that, yes, there are Negroes in heaven. And when the Negroes arrive in heaven, they aren't black anymore. They're shining white. Um, which is kind of a messed up answer uh, to, to a, a weird question. Um, one of the things that, that spiritualists uh, like to, to tell you is that when, if you're sick here, if there's something wrong with you here, when you get to the happy summer land, you're all better, you're all fixed. So when, when Negroes get to the happy summer land, they're not Negroes anymore. Trying to say something nice, I guess, but it's still kind of a, a messed up answer uh, to the question. So, it spreads um, and people uh, go to seances and a lot of really interesting and weird characters uh, start cropping up and um, uh, giving these performances. And uh, one of the, the early adopters, one of the, the early uh, figures who emerge are these two brothers from Buffalo named the Davenport brothers. Um, they're from Buffalo. Buffalo is not too far from Rochester, so it must be something in the water up there. Uh, but the, the Davenport brothers, uh, they go to New York City, they give these demonstrations uh, where they'll be on stage and the lights will be brought down, so it's pitch dark, and then sounds uh, come from nowhere. People will, will leave um, you know, instruments on the, on the, on the stage, uh, and then suddenly the instruments are being played in the dark. It must be the spirits. This doesn't last very long because somebody uh, eventually lights a match during one of the, uh, the performances, and of course, it's just the brothers on stage running around in the dark playing instruments and causing all this ruckus. They go home to Buffalo uh, to, to reconsider uh, what they're doing, and, and they come up with the spirit cabinet. Um, and their cabinet, the one that they use, is a large kind of a, like, like, a, like a wardrobe um, kind of a cabinet. It's got three doors on it, and there's this uh, diamond-shaped window cut in the middle of them. Uh, middle uh, door that's up on sawhorses. So now in their performances, they will uh, get into the cabinet, they'll sit down and they'll get volunteers from the audience to tie them hand and foot. Um, and then the, the, the audience will put, um, you know, a, a guitar and a tambourine and, and a, a pistol loaded with blanks. Um, they'll put that in the cabinet. They close the doors. Now the, the, they have the darkness that they need uh, to manifest the spirits and and now suddenly this this ungodly ruckus uh starts in the the cabin they hear the tambourine shake they hear knocks on the the door uh sometimes uh, a hand will come out that diamond shaped window and it'll wave a handkerchief around uh and then you run up to the the cabinet you open up the doors and the brothers are still sitting there tied up absolutely tightly uh, as they were before people start upping the ante with this they they give the the brothers handfuls of flour uh to hold or handfuls of pennies uh to hold and um this is you know to, to keep them from from doing anything um and and they still produce these weird manifestations well if it's not these guys getting out of the their bonds to to you know play the instruments and and, and throw things out the the diamond shaped window well it, it must be the spirits right they go to liverpool uh they, they tour actually throughout europe down into cuba um and even into australia uh in liverpool they are doing a performance uh, at a hall and there are a bunch of British sailors, British Royal Navy uh, sailors in the audience. Sailors know from knots. Uh, so they ask for some volunteers to, um, uh, to tie them um, in the cabinet. A bunch of sailors come up, tie the brothers hand and foot, and the brothers are not getting, getting out of this at all. Um, they close up the cabinet and no manifestations are forthcoming. Um, the crowd is not at all happy. A similar thing happens to them when they're uh, touring in Cuba. Uh, and I understand that actually the um, they were tied uh, very securely and manifestations were not forthcoming. And the, the crowd broke up and, and yelled and rioted and apparently broke up the cabinet from what, uh, from what I've read. Um, but they, uh, they're an early um, uh, big name uh, in spiritualism. But they didn't actually say they were spiritualists. 
uh, they would have a lecturer who used to come with them. Harry Keller, who's a famous magician, was their lecturer for a while. Uh, he would come out and he would talk about the spirits and spirit power and what the spirits could do. Uh, then he would introduce the brothers. And the, the brothers never really said they were spiritualists. But they never said they weren't either. They kind of just left that for the audience uh, to figure out. And, and of course, people argued. Um, controversy sells tickets. So it's really helpful uh, in, in many ways to, to not make a direct claim because that, that sets you up to be uh, attacked. But the Davenports uh, toured for, for years um, and were, were very popular and, and very controversial. Um, another one of the uh, uh, really popular um, uh, spirit mediums um, was a guy named William Mumler. Uh, Mumler's from Boston. Uh, he's a photographer. And he um, one day he's taking some photographs uh, there in his studio. And when he develops the photos, this is 1850s, so it's the, the big um, wet glass plate kind of photography that I don't really even understand. Uh, how it works, where you know, you you hide under the the cloth while you're taking the the photo. It's it's that kind of um, stuff you see in old movies. When he's developing uh, the photographs uh, later, he notices that there are the these figures behind the sitter who weren't there when the photo was taken, uh, and then people start going to Mumler thinking uh, that they want their photo taken to see who ends up uh, standing behind them. And people then start recognizing deceased relatives standing behind them in these photographs. Um, and now people are winding up, uh, lining up around the block to get their spirit photo uh, taken with um, uh, Mumler's studio. Somebody then notices that some of the spirit extras, as they call some of the, as they're called, the these figures that are appearing behind people, uh, sitters in photographs, are other people who previously had their photographs taken and who are very much alive. Then Mumler decides it might be time to go to New York. Uh, so he packs up and he goes to New York City and he starts all over again. He sets up a, a photography studio. People start uh, having photographs taken, and there are these weird figures uh, behind behind them, people who shouldn't be there, people who weren't there when the photographs were being taken. The spirits are showing up in photographs in New York, too. But then people realize that some of these spirit extras have been clipped out of magazines. Um, he gets accused of fraud. He gets put on trial for fraud uh, in New York. And uh, P.T. Barnum. Uh, shows up to uh, uh, as a witness for the prosecution. Uh, he said that he had uh, asked to uh, he obtained a couple of Mumler's spirit photographs to put in that museum I mentioned before um, of, of curiosities, um, and he wanted them to put them on display under the heading of spiritualistic humbugs. So he appears for the, the prosecution. Um, Mumler uh, gets off. Mumler is, is uh, uh, acquitted because so many people line up. Uh, saying, no, I, I don't care what P.T. Barnum says. I know he's innocent. I know that's my grandmother. I know that that's my deceased brother. I know. Uh, and he, he's actually able to, to, to beat the charge. He lives to fight another day. Uh, so he's another sort of weird, early, uh, famous spiritualist. In keeping with the, the Davenports and their sort of public demonstrations from the, the stage, uh, there's a woman named Anna Eva Fay, who's a... Uh, uh, called the indescribable phenomenon, um, and she's a, a stage medium uh, who travels the country. She's from Ohio. She ends up out here in New England, uh, and she goes on the vaudeville stage to give uh, demonstrations of psychic power. And she's amazing. Um, the The first half of her her show um, it looks like kind of a pretty standard magic act. She uh, she has this um, this wrapping hand, this hand that sits on a pane of glass and wraps out answers to questions. Um, there's a handkerchief, that uh, a dancing handkerchief routine to, to magicians. Um, it's, you know, holding a handkerchief like this, uh, and it, it wiggles and, and, and does uh, does things on, on command. Um, but then her, her real, the, the real deal, the real stuff that, that impresses people uh, is the second half, um, where she uh, sits in the middle of the stage and she is tied by her neck and her, her arms, uh, and she's tied to a post uh, there in the middle of the stage. And then a curtain is set up. She, her cabinet is not like the Davenport brothers. Uh, it's not a wooden cabinet. It's actually um, a pipe and drape uh, kind of uh, arrangement. 
there's a curtain uh, drawn across the front of the cabinet. And when the, the curtain is drawn, uh, suddenly a tambourine uh, rattles, um, a guitar is playing. There are things thrown over the top of the cabinet. When you whisk the uh, the curtain aside, she is, is there tied as tightly as she uh, ever was to begin with. She couldn't possibly have moved, let alone uh, reached over and grabbed a gun and fired blanks off. Uh, it, it can't be this this little tiny woman um, doing any of this stuff. It must be the spirits. People believe the evidence of their own eyes. Uh, later, she, she modifies the act. Uh, she becomes very famous for answering questions she couldn't possibly know. Uh, you'll write down questions on a piece of paper and you'll, you'll keep it on you uh, generally, and she'll be sitting in the middle of the, the stage, uh, and she will answer the questions um, that, uh, that you've got, you know, tucked in your vest pocket, uh, written down on a little piece of paper. She'll answer them accurately. Uh, they have to keep upping the ante. Um, she eventually, so that she can't be getting any kind of signals, they put a sheet over her. So the act is she's sitting on a chair with a sheet over her that's been tacked down all around uh, the stage. It's absurd, uh, but people line up to see this Anna Eva Faye, and she's very popular um, and, and travels uh, throughout vaudeville, making a lot of money and making a lot of believers. Um, even though she, like the Davenport brothers, is one of those people who doesn't say she's real, doesn't say she's not. Um, she actually gets tested by a famous uh, scientist in the UK, uh, William Crooks. Crooks um, is a, a scientist who wants to test spiritualist claims, mediumistic claims, and what he does with her is uh, he hooks her up to a galvanometer. Uh, she goes to his house and he, he's rigged up this system where she has to hold on to these two handles um, to complete an electrical circuit. There's electricity being run not through her body but over her body. Um, and if she lets go of one of the handles to, to, you know, reach for something and do something tricky, uh, the circuit will be broken and, and they'll know that, that she's up to something. But she's able to do all of her, her weird manifestations. Uh, things move when they're not supposed to, um, weird sounds, weird raps are, are, are heard. All kinds of strange manifestations uh, occur, and the, the circuit is never broken. How is she doing this? Uh, well, she never says. Um, and she's uh, she's still justly famous. Um, and she's, uh, you know, the woman that that, uh, that Crooks has tested and is astounded. He doesn't know what could be going on. She must be real. How could you beat the galvanometer? Uh, if you let go of one of the handles, you'll get a shock. Um, if you're hooked up to, to one of these things. I have been hooked up to an electric gadget like this, and I have let go of one handle, and I kept getting a shock. It was fairly unpleasant. So um, there are these weird ways of testing mediums, like hooking them up to, uh, to, to galvanometers. Um, one of the other fellows, probably my favorite, actually, one of my favorite stories um, in, in the whole spiritualist movement, um, is this guy named Henry Slade, Dr. Henry Slade, who wasn't a doctor. He just called himself that because he liked the way it sounded. Uh, and it made him, you know, sound legitimate. Uh, Dr. Henry Slade is an exponent of what they call independent slate writing. Now, this uh, independent slate writing is is the seance manifestation par excellence. This is the, the ne plus ultra of seance manifestations. This is the thing that makes more people believe in the reality of spirit phenomena than probably all other things combined. Uh, it's a very simple uh, feat. It's a very simple uh, manifestation. It uses what was a common writing surface back then, a couple of uh, little school slates. I, I, I got some over there. I, I'm not going to wander over and get them, sorry. Um, but little chalkboards that kids would have used in school. You would have seen them uh, in Little House on the Prairie in the schoolroom. So a little slate with a little wooden frame. Uh, but Henry Slade... Uh, we'll take two of these, he'll put them together with a little piece of chalk uh, in between them, and then, according to him, uh, the spirits will then manipulate the chalk and spell out a message from the beyond. Um, or, sometimes, uh, he'll sit down at a table with you opposite him. He does private sittings. He'll sit down at a table with you on, on the other side of the table. Uh, you will pick uh, the slate you want to use. He will then hold it under the table. Darkness is very important. Hold it under the table. He'll put a piece of chalk on top of it. You'll then hold hands over the table, um, and you'll hold 
uh, each side of the slate underneath the table. And after a few minutes, uh, you can take the slate out from underneath the table and there will be a message uh, scrawled out from the beyond. He has a uh, sitting with Charles Darwin uh, in his career at one point. And when he uh, when he sits with Darwin, the, the message that Darwin gets is um, the opening chapters of Genesis written in Greek uh, in chalk. That slate still exists. Uh, it's not been erased. It is still in Cambridge, England, uh, where the sitting took place. So when he sits with Darwin, Mr. Evolution, he gives him a message uh, that's the opening chapters of Genesis, of special creation uh, by God, kind of a way of saying, yes, yeah, suck it, Darwin, uh, Mr. Evolution. We don't come from monkeys. Uh, here's the opening chapter of Genesis in Greek. Um, so Henry Slade's uh, amazing. Now, um, he has a, a sitting with a guy named Truesdale. And Truesdale is a skeptic. He's not really buying any of this. Uh, Truesdale um, lays a trap uh, for, for Henry Slade. He writes a letter to himself, uh, which is supposed to be from a sister in Europe. He doesn't have a sister in Europe. And it, it contains, uh, you know, oh, I can't wait to see you, um, you know, over the summer, we're going to go to Australia and, you know, bits and pieces of, of, of a regular letter, um, plans for the summer and how's dad and this sort of thing. Um, he falls out, puts it in the inner pocket of his coat. He books a private sitting, uh, with Henry Slade. He leaves his coat in the hall with the letter in it. Uh, he goes into the sitting room and he's cooling his heels, waiting for Henry Slade uh, to show up. While he's waiting for Slade, he searches through the room. He, he goes around looking um, for, uh, for for any, any traps, any sort of weirdness, uh, and he finds under one of the tables, uh, he finds a, a slate that is attached to the underside of one of the tables. He knows that this is clearly fishy. Um, the the slate has kind of a, a, a sales pitch uh, sort of meeting. It says, you know, we're we're so glad you you've come. Uh, we have so much to tell you. Please, you have to come back again and again and again. We have so much to tell you. It will uh, probably take a number of attempts uh, to get all the information to you. You have to keep coming back, booking more and more sessions. A sales pitch kind of meeting. Uh, Truesdale wipes out that message, takes out a piece of chalk, uh, and he writes on the slate, look out for this fellow, Henry. He is up to snuff. And he signs the name Alcinda. Alcinda was the name of Henry Slade's recently deceased wife. Truesdale puts the slate back where he found it, uh, takes a seat, reads a magazine, waiting for Slade to show up. Slade enters the room uh, a few minutes later. They, they shake hands. Uh, they sit down at the table. Slade goes into a, a trance and says, the spirits tell me that you're going to Australia uh, next year with your sister who's in Europe. All the fake information he's left in the letter in his coat pocket in the hall. Slade's clearly read this. Uh, then they get to the, the slate writing portion. Um, they uh, uh, Truesdale picks uh, a slate. Uh, Slade puts it under the table. And um, a few minutes later, uh, they lift the, the slate out from underneath the table. And I guess Truesdale kind of looks at it, looks at the message and says, oh, I, I think this is for you. Uh, and shows this to Henry Slade. Henry Slade promptly freaks out. Um, I don't think he thinks that Alcinda has really come through. He, he realizes he's been had. He then breaks down and tells Truesdale everything. Um, he's kind of bragging at, at his ability and, and how good he is. He demonstrates to, uh, to Truesdale that he can write with chalk in either hand. Uh, he can write with chalk between the toes of either foot. This guy can write full legible sentences with chalk in between the toes of either foot. Uh, he can write with a stick of chalk in his mouth. Uh, he can also write backwards um, as fast as you can dictate to him. Uh, so he writes backwards so that you have to hold the slate up to a mirror in order to, to read the message. He was famous for this sort of thing. Um, Henry Slade's amazing. Um, now, Truesdale uh, takes takes down notes, and um, he uh, he sits on this information for a good 20 years until he writes a book uh, called The Bottom Facts and the Cases Against Spiritualism uh, a good 20 years later, um, which includes uh, Slade's uh, confession to him. Slade does get arrested for fraud, but he gets off on an appeal uh, because the, the fraud charge doesn't specifically mention uh, 
that he's defrauding people through uh, palmistry and trick and spiritualistic trickery. So he's able to, to beat the rap because the, the charge is not quite worded right. He heads back to America um, and he, he dies in the, the 1870s out in Michigan. Uh, and, and unfortunately, he, he, he apparently comes to a bad end. I'm a little unclear on the, the later phases of his life, but um, he dies in Michigan in uh, an asylum. Uh, he was described as a uh, a friendless, penniless lunatic. Uh, so he, he ends uh, he ends his days uh, in, in a, a lunatic asylum. And apparently, after death, it's discovered that he's also a hermaphrodite, just to make the story even weirder. Now, uh, the last uh, kind of really wild figure uh, I want to talk about is uh, another local. She's from Boston. Uh, this is a woman named uh, Mrs. Lenore Piper, Lenore E. Piper, Mrs. Piper. 19th century, you still call women Mrs. Piper. Uh, you, you still refer to them by their husband's names. Uh, and Mrs. Piper is what they call a direct voice medium. So no, no spirit raps, no slate writing, no cabinet, no. Uh, she goes into a trance and she tells you things she can't possibly know. Information she can't possibly have. You get to ask her questions. Uh, you ask her questions into her hand, uh, like the spirit telephone. You ask her, you, you direct your question into her hand and she will answer your question uh, by direct voice. Things she can't possibly know. She's very popular. She's very famous. Uh, people are astounded by what she does. She actually attracts the attention of William James um, at Harvard. William James, the uh, Varieties of Religious Experience, the guy who writes one of the, the most important works on uh, psychology and, and religion. Um, and he's a Harvard professor, at one of the Jameses, uh, Henry James, uh, his brother Alice, is it Alice James, the, the sister? Um, so the, one of the James uh, family, very well known, uh, and, and not, not a, a dumb bunch of people, but William James gets involved. He goes to seances with her, and, and he's, he's very, very impressed uh, with what she does. He can't quite fathom uh, what it is uh, that, that she's doing. Um, he... He does come to believe, uh, at least in a qualified sort of way, he's pretty sure that there's something real uh, going on here. He never does say what it is that makes him a believer, though, that, that really convinces him. Um, I, I've looked around through his writings, and I haven't been able to find any, um, any mention of, you know, this is what convinced me, this is what converted me, this is what made me believe. Um, whatever it is, he, he doesn't describe it, he doesn't uh, get into it. Which I guess is only fitting, because if you're going to believe in the afterlife, whatever brings you around has got to be something very personal, and probably not something you really feel like talking to people uh, about a lot. Um, in one of his essays, though, um, he he uh, he's talking about Mrs. Piper, and and you know he's not a dumb guy, um, and he uh, he writes that. Uh, that he, he's aware of the exposures that have gone uh, before and the controversies that he, he knows about some of the, the sort of trickery that can be involved, but he still thinks there's something real going on. He says, when imposture has been checked off as far as possible, when chance coincidence has been allowed for, when opportunities for normal knowledge on the part of the subject have been noted and skill in fishing and following clues unwittingly furnished by the voice or face of bystanders have all been counted in, those who have the fullest acquaintance with the phenomena admit that in good mediums there is a residuum of knowledge displayed that can only be supernormal. So he says even when you, you look at these people and you're aware of the kind of trickery that they can engage in, there's still something going on. There's still just a little kernel that you can't quite explain and get your head around. And that uh, seems to be uh, what, uh, what, what convinces him and, and what kind of makes him kind of leave this open. There, there's something going on here if, if we can't quite pinpoint it. Um, he mentions uh, also in the Varieties of Religious Experience, his, uh, his big magnum opus, he, he mentions that he, he kind of leaves this question open. Um, that he, he still thinks there's something going on there. So... Um, Things are, are, are progressing. Uh, people are going to seances. People are still arguing uh, the, the, what this all means, the implications of it. And um, spiritualism uh, is very popular for the first few years. When it, uh, the 1840s, it gets very popular. It kind of dies down for a bit. It then gets very popular again during uh, after the Civil War. 
uh, because after the Civil War, so many people have lost someone somewhere, fathers, sons, brothers, uh, have died uh, being destroyed in the Civil War that everyone's looking to, to get make contact with someone that they've lost. Everyone's lost someone somewhere. Uh, so they go to seances again to try to contact uh, these deceased loved ones. In the early days, um, spirit mediums would have a spirit guide, which was your sort of go-to uh, in the spirit world. Uh, the popular sort of spirit guide for a long time was an American Indian uh, because they were they were simple spiritual people. So they were the right kind of figure um, that you would you would contact and your your spirit um your, your, your spirit guide um, would then go get people for you. So you would contact your spirit guide to go get specific people that uh, you wanted to, to, to hear from. American Indians are very popular, but then after the Civil War, the Civil War drummer boy becomes the, the, the spirit guide of choice. That's a sort of, you know, sad, pathetic kind of figure, a, a child who went to war uh, and was killed in a battle. So that, that's the right sort of tugging at your heartstrings uh, kind of figure to uh to be your spirit guide um so it gets very popular again after the uh the civil war it kind of dies down again it never really fades out entirely but it does have these sort of peaks and valleys uh over the, the history of it 1888 bombshell uh margaret fox uh one of the original fox sisters she uh confesses the whole thing she said had started as a prank to frighten their mother uh, she confesses on the stage of the, I think it's the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York, uh, another public demonstration. Uh, she confesses the whole thing about a prank. Uh, the weird spirit raps uh, were produced by the two girls cracking the joints of their toes. Now, when it first started out, they had uh, strung an apple uh, on a piece of thread, and they had that uh, hanging behind their, their bed, and they would... Uh, pull on the thread and thump the apple uh, against the wall, and their mother thought there was something uh, strange going on. Then later they realized that they could actually produce this, a similar sound, a uh, much louder sound, uh, by cracking the joints of their toes. So Margaret confesses uh, that this was all uh, a hoax. Uh, Kate, her sister, is, I guess, in the balcony, uh, kind of nodding and agreeing, yet, yeah, yes, this, this was all trickery. Uh, this was all a, a prank that got way out of hand. Uh, but by, by this time in their life, uh, they've had these really terrible lives. Um, the, the Fox sisters, they start out as, as these two young girls from upstate New York. Uh, by the 1880s, they are these kind of broken down, alcoholic, middle-aged women. They have really terrible lives. Um, and uh, I think by the, by, by the 1880s, uh, they've just had enough. Um, and they think they need to, to, to finish what they started. Uh, so Margaret actually plans to go on a, um, a lecture tour uh, exposing spiritualism. She will um, tour the, the country uh, demonstrating these this toe cracking that she can do, uh, which she, she demonstrates there at, uh, in, in Brooklyn. Um, and she will she will she will lay the ghost. She will drive a stake through spiritualism's heart. She started it. She's gonna end it, um, but it doesn't really happen. Um, people are interested in hearing that the spirits come back. They're not interested in hearing that the spirits don't come back. So the, the lecture tour never materializes, for lack of a better word. Um, and uh, so she, she's broke. She's alcoholic. There, there are problems where her children get taken away by child services. Um, really awful lives. At the end of their lives get very mucky and very confusing. Um, so with nowhere else to go, with money running out, no money coming in, um, she goes back to mediumship. She decides she has to hold seances. This is the only life she knows. Uh, she goes back to seances, uh, saying, no, no, you know, that, that, that confession, that, that was just me, you know. Um, no, it, it, it's actually, uh, it's all real. Forget what I said. Uh, please come to, to seances. Uh, again, but the rich and the famous don't come anymore. She ekes out a living um, for another few years. Um, and uh, all the, the Fox sisters, uh, they all die in the 1890s, a couple of years apart from each other. And the uh, Katie and Maggie, the, the two women who, who started uh, spiritualism, uh, they're, they're, I'm not sure where they're buried. I think they're buried in pauper's graves in New York, so we don't really know uh, where they are. 
because they they end up just living these dreadful poor grinding lives um and that seems to be the case with a lot of mediums uh they, they all seem to to end up living these kind of miserable lives dying in an asylum like uh henry slade um so uh people have always gone to seances and they're always going to because even though the fox sisters uh said no this this is all uh a fraud we're cracking the joints of our toes uh even though they said it was uh not real people still go to seances to this day uh so thank you for coming to my not ted talk um thank you for coming uh coming along I, i'm rory raven um I can keep talking about this uh, for the rest of the night, but but nobody uh, wants to listen to me talk about this for the rest of the night. If you have any questions, uh, ask me there in uh, the comments. I will try to answer uh, any questions that I see uh, that I can answer. And if um, if you don't, um, then you can always uh, send me questions uh, in in Facebook Messenger, um, and I will try to uh, answer questions. And somebody has the same phrenology head that I have behind me. Yes, um, I bought that, I think, at Old Sturbridge Village uh, some years ago. And doo -doo -doo -doo, there's a lot of very lovely uh, things that people are saying, uh, but no actual questions, which is completely fine. Um, and um, somebody asks... <laughs> Somebody asks, uh, have I visited Houdini's grave? Yes. Um, Houdini uh, is, is a more 20th century figure. He gets involved in a crusade against spiritualism um, because he knows how trickery works. Um, and uh, so I, I've always been a kind of a big Houdini fan, even though he's a total egomaniac and kind of a problematic figure. Uh, I still have to kind of admire him. Uh, he is buried in a Jewish cemetery in Queens, Machpelah Cemetery. And my wife and I went out there a number of years ago. My wife's from Queens. Once visiting her family, uh, I said, I'd really like to go visit Houdini's grave. Uh, so we head out to Machpella Cemetery and and we we drive in the front gate and I, I look around and it's just it's just packed. I mean, here in New England, you know, your graveyard's a little more spread out. In New York, they're just packed. And I'm looking around thinking, this place is huge. There are eight million thousand gravestones here. Um, we will never find uh, his grave. Oh, there, there it is right over there. Okay, so it took five minutes. Uh, walking, not even five minutes. Um, so yeah, found his, his grave really, really easily. Um, so yes, and it's a very, very big stone uh, grave. Uh, it's a, they call it an excedra. Um, it's a huge um, kind of bench and, and, uh, and, and stuff. It's, uh, it's huge and very difficult to miss. So... Um, so, folks, uh, yes, um, somebody points out the Devonport's dad, uh, the, the Devonport brothers, uh, their dad was a, uh, a detective, a police detective in Buffalo, um, who I think knew uh, a few things uh, about trickery. Um, somebody mentions Mae West. Mae West, again, 20th century. Uh, Mae West goes to mediums uh, to get, um, get advice and... Um, the, the mediums that she likes are the ones that where you write down questions and fold them up and, and put them on the table and then the medium blindfolds themselves and then tells you what's written down on the slips of paper. And at one point she says, unless they can read Bellet's blindfold, I don't think they're truly great prophets. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's what I came across about uh, Mae West. So, all right. Um, plenty of, uh, of, of lovely things that you folks are saying and I appreciate all of them. But no actual questions, which is totally fine. Uh, if you do have questions, if I didn't make anything clear, I, I, I know I talk fast. I know I talk a lot. Um, if I didn't make anything clear, if you have any questions that you think of uh, later tonight or early tomorrow, slip me a, a direct message. I, I'm happy to, to try to answer questions. And uh, thank you folks all for coming out. This is my first attempt at doing something like this. I know people have been doing a lot of Facebook Live presentations this is my first attempt at doing something like this uh hopefully it went okay i'll keep doing more on other topics that i i know about because i know about like three or four things that i can talk about um and i'll be happy to do those if there is sufficient interest thank you folks all for coming out and listening to me babble on about something that fascinates me i i hope you got something out of it uh and had some fun and um i will hopefully see you all soon so um boo and I'll try to figure out how to end this live video. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming out.